Hello, my friends. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for me to put into words exactly kind of what I'm speaking of in this video, but I'll, of course, do the best that I can with it, um, just being a man of flesh, simple in this world. But what I believe is happening, and if you're a part of this, uh, you would be experiencing along with me and along with all the others, as I believe we're walking the path of the arrest the torture, the beating, the carrying of the cross, and ultimately the crucifixion and the resurrection. I believe we're walking the same exact path. Um, you could see it manifest in your own life, if you understand what I'm saying, wondering why maybe you're so mournful, or you have physical ailments happening things happening with your health that there's not really any explanations for, things that have come out of nowhere. Uh, I believe that that's all part of this, because what we are as the body of Christ is we share in his suffering. Now, he took the physical suffering, the body. He took the removal of death by becoming death himself on the cross. He did the physical piece. He fulfilled every aspect of the law. But what people don't know of the cross and what it was, was it's a divorce. It's an ending. It's a separation. It's a parting. It's a cutting away. When Jesus, speaking before he goes, he does not sleep that night. Obviously, before he is arrested, he doesn't sleep. And he goes out multiple times praying. And he's saying, Father, if you will, take this cup from me. And we think of this from a human aspect, from flesh. Uh, I know I have also, I've understood it in different ways, but that's primarily what our thoughts are of it. But when you see this, you'll recognize something. When he says, if you will, take this cup from me, He's bargaining, he's petitioning, and he's doing it on behalf of a people. He's doing it on behalf of Israel, the Jews at the time who were of the covenant. He's doing it on their sake. When Jesus does anything, he comes in his Father doing it. Jesus was led, Jesus walked that path. And what was his path? It was a path of mercy to forgive all and every bit of adultery and sin that came to God. He bore it on himself, the sin of his people. He stood in the gap. Taking the cup away would be like those in Nineveh who all donned their sackcloth and ashes and repented. God was going to pour a cup onto Nineveh, a cup of destruction, a cup of judgment, and the people all turned. So God did not pour the cup. But Jesus, in that moment, was doing the same exact thing. Take this cup away. Do not do what you have planned. But the people were not willing like Nineveh was willing. The Pharisees and the scribes, the people who were alive during those days, they were not willing. And it's the Father who handed down the judgment. The Son takes all sin onto Himself, takes all burdens, takes all pain and suffering and misery. He takes it all on Himself. But the Father is the Father. It's a separate entity. The Father is spirit and truth. And when it comes time for Him to execute a judgment, there is nothing on the earth that prevents that judgment from occurring. What the cross was was a day of execution on everything that was of the Old Covenant, the Jews, Israel, all of it. It was a day of divorce, a cutting away. And Jesus, by making that declaration, take this cup from me, he's in a form of repentance, which is why he spent that whole night mourning, deeply crying out, because he did not want that to come. But at the same time, he was aware that he knew it was time to do it, which is why when Judas came with, with the Romans and they arrested Jesus and Judas turned him over with a kiss, 
He knew his time had come. There was no escaping that. It was a clock that once it began, because they were unwilling, the clock would not turn back. The judgment would not be stayed. When Jesus was up on the cross and he's crying out, Abba, Abba, forgive them. They know not what they do. He is still bargaining for God to take him off of that cross. He didn't do it himself. In other words, this is very difficult, but anyone of spirit will be able to understand this. Jesus is God. He's a form of God. He was fully man, fully human. He came in the flesh. But he had a different mission than God the Father and Spirit. His mission was only of mercy for the house of Israel. That they turn and accept him. He did everything he could for them to accept him. But they would not accept him. They could not accept them. For God had hardened their hearts because of what they had within their hearts. So when Jesus is saying, take this cup from me, and when Jesus is crying out, forgive them, they know not what they're due, he's essentially pleading with the Spirit to take him down off of that cross, that they believe in that hour, that they see what's happening, that they believe and turn, and that God takes him off of that cross, and the kingdom is set up. It's not because he's suffering and in pain and in human fleshly pain. It's got nothing to do with why he's crying out. That's something I once understood, and it is part of it. it it's, he's a blueprint for what the flesh experiences and goes through, but it's much deeper than that. He's crying out for God to take him down off of that cross, but without him doing it himself. In other words, he's trying to stay the judgment, the execution, but the people were not willing. So God left him on the cross and he died on the cross. He gave up the ghost. And whenever he gave up that ghost, there was great darkness that came over the land of Jerusalem. And that darkness began at about 12 o'clock and it ended at about 3 o'clock. And this would have been a supernatural darkness to hover over that land for three hours because he was performing the law. He was fulfilling the law, and the law was supernatural, filled with supernatural signs and wonders because the Jews would not believe otherwise. Whenever Jesus, or whenever John the Baptist is asking about Jesus, and they're telling John about the signs that Jesus performed, well, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, so on and so forth. It's John the Baptist needing those signs to understand that the time he was preaching for had come. And Jesus gave us the very same signals. Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. When you see all these things, know that summer is near. Earthquakes in diverse places, when the gospel has been spread to the whole world, when brother is against brother, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, when there's pestilence and great famines, all of these things that Jesus spoke about, fearful, wonderful signs in the heavens that we've been seeing, when all of these things that, that we're talking about today was the very same conversation that John the Baptist had about the signs that Jesus was performing. We can say, yes, Jesus, God is performing these signs for us to see. All of these things Jesus spoke of have come to pass. So we know by that that the time has come. But then there came a midnight hour whenever Jesus knew they were coming to arrest him. And whenever he would be put up on the cross for the sins of mankind. There came that midnight hour. And that was... No longer is there time in this ministry, for the end of it has come. In other words, they were in the season. John knew they were in the season by the signs that Jesus performed. And Jesus knew when it was time for the end of that season. And for us, what would the end of that season look like? What is our Gethsemane? It's the crucifixion of the Holy Spirit. The crucifixion of the spirit rather than the flesh. So if you're having these symptoms and signs and just the way that you're feeling, you're sharing in suffering, 
because you're sharing and suffering the exact events that he suffered in his body, but it's distributed to all of us who are of the body of Christ. We each get a portion of that same suffering as we're being crucified with him, but in the form of a spirit. Our flesh may manifest what the spirit is going through, and we're going to feel mournful and sorrowful because that's how he felt, but it's distributed amongst the body so that by sharing in this crucifixion, we will also raise from the dead out of it. But without our flesh dying, as he took the flesh death for himself, so that some standing here today will not taste it. The flesh death he took, meaning that when the time of the crucifixion of the Spirit occurs, there's no bodily death. There's only raised in glory. The trials that we're going through today as a woman in travail, when the baby is born, we forget all about those things that we experienced. Just like blinking an eye and the twinkling of an eye, you are here and then you are not. You are changed, raised up with him from the crucifixion. Same events in parallel to 2,000 years ago only worked amongst an entire body of people that were not even aware of each other yet. Which is why Paul says now we are aware of a little, but when that time comes, we will be made fully aware and fully of each other. We don't know out there who is of us, but we know that they are. And we know that we are suffering right now because we're walking into the crucifixion. And what is that crucifixion going to look like? For then, it was the Jews having him arrested and declaring to crucify him, calling him a blasphemer, putting him on the cross and executing him. But for us, it's going to be different. For us, we see the signs of this happening, such as with the red heifer. I'm listening to a video this morning of somebody who is a, a pro, profound teacher of God, supposedly. And he's talking about how the priests, by bathing in the ashes of the red heifer, will be able to ritually cleanse themselves and be purified for the sacred raising of the temple. This is a Christian saying that. Literally saying that one can be clean by bathing in the ashes of a red heifer. A Christian saying that. Do you think they're really a Christian? Do you think they're really suffering in what you're suffering in? Of course not. They're the Judas. They're handing him over. Their desire is for another God, not him. And that is the crucifixion of the Holy Spirit. Turning over the God that they knew for a foreign God, which is Satan. And when the days of the Great Tribulation happens, you see these little things as hints here and there. How that Candace Owens lady was fired and called an anti-Semite for making a comment that Christ is king. Do you see what they're setting up when Satan comes into power with the synagogue? They're setting up that anybody who stands for Christ at all during those days will be rounded up. They won't be able to buy or sell. They'll be rounded up just as the sign that was given in the 1940s of what it will look like at the end. Only they're the ones that are doing it because it's not them. It's Satan controlling them. This is the signs to understand that the Holy Spirit is not being listened to anymore. It's not being wanted anymore. They're handing themselves over to Satan and agreeing and believing everything Satan is showing them and doing for them, all the lying signs and wonders. They're believing in the flesh. They're looking at the earth. Now we go to April 8th and we look at when the eclipse begins, begins at about 12 and it ends at about 3. In totality, of course, is a lot less. But the scriptures say in darkness will cover the land, the entirety of the land. doesn't mean that it needs to be fully covered for three hours. But to fulfill the scriptures, this would. As there's an eclipse going across the United States, every single state will be affected by it where darkness will be hovering and moving over that land for three hours, just as it was during Christ's crucifixion 2,000 years ago. There, 
It had to be a supernatural sign over Jerusalem itself, the covenant land. Why is it over America now? Because America, through the harlot, that fallen church that spread the gospel throughout the entire world, they did their works, but they did it unrighteously. She makes all the nations drink of her maddening wine. Meaning that because of America, all of the world has fallen into this snare, fallen into this trap. She is the last one not to turn, and she has turned, going after other gods and after other idols. America is the sign of the end, Mystery Babylon. And she is the sign also where her Lord was crucified. Just like what happened in Jerusalem, this is happening in here in the spirit to the body of Christ. A three-hour darkness that covers the entirety of the land. When we're witnessing everything else Jesus spoke that would happen, we know we've entered into the midnight hour of that. And that is the day of the crucifixion. And then what happened in the crucifixion? The temple veil was torn in two. What happens to America? The country will be torn into two. And those who are lost will say, look, God has done this because we have turned our back against Israel. He has divided the land because we've divided the land of Israel. Never seeing the snare that they've entered into. Never recognizing that when those who call themselves Jews and who live in Israel, when they come into power, they'll no longer need those Christians who put them into power. They'll turn them over. That's the Great Tribulations. That's the Second Holocaust. When Satan is given power to rule over all of those who put him into power, do you think Satan is going to have mercy on him like Jesus had mercy on him? No. That's the Great Tribulations. And that's how it begins. Something happens after that which allows Satan to come into power and roll from another temple in Jerusalem that isn't God. And we have this sign. We have all of these things happen, and we have this day of April 8th working in exact parallel to what happened 2,000 years ago if you have the eyes to see it and recognize. And what does this fallen church do? She looks at every other day, every feast day, every holiday, every Jewish day, every Christian day, every other sign, and she calls them marvelous. And she says, this has to be the day of the rapture. But on this one, I see many going the other way, saying, this is nothing but a sign of judgment for America. Nothing's going to happen on that day. When it's an exact parallel of what happened 2,000 years ago. If I were to look at a sign and zero in on it and say, this has to mean something, it would be this. And that's the only sign they cannot see. And I can't say with certainty what happens on that day. As everything that I'm telling you here is coming from me. It's coming from what I've experienced and walked. And I'm fallible. The spirit that works in me covers that which I am wrong for. It covers my sin. But if there was ever a time to look and expect something, it would be here. It would be that day. It would be this event. Because everything is exactly the same as it was then. The same things that happened to Jesus, we're watching them replay, only towards the body of Christ instead of him. And Satan goes after the offspring, remember that. So we're very short time to this day, and we see all of these strange things happening in the world. You see that ship taking over and destroying the Francis Scott Key Bridge. You know, the writer of the National Anthem for America, the Star Spangled Banner. You see that the ship lost power and then it got power back as it steered right into the, the pier. And it, it reminds me of all the airplanes falling out of the sky and how I've seen that. How they all lose power and just drop out of the sky as if there's nothing controlling them. You have that happen now and then you have the events that 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 are able to happen come April 8th to fulfill the scriptures. 
And that's the only day that so many of these people are saying, eh, it means nothing. It's not going to be anything. It just means judgment. Judgment coming to the future. Because this people has grown lukewarm. This people does not stand in the gap like Jesus did. Jesus is saying, take this cup from me, Father. Do not do what you are doing. Let me get off of this cross. Let them take me off the cross and I will heal their land and restore them. Let them take me off of here. I forgive them. But the Father knows the hearts of the people so that he would not take Jesus off the cross. And that's the position that we stand in today as a body of Christ. We should be mourning, weeping for the people that are lost, that have no idea what they're doing. They know not what they do. Father, take this cup from us. Do not do what you are planning to do. But this generation is like, like somebody living with their grandmother. Let's say children living with their grandmother. And the grandmother worked her whole life and helped pay the bills living in this household. But then quickly she got too old and she couldn't work anymore. And she began to slack on the bills. So the children say, we have to do something about grandma because she's no longer helping us pay the bills. Uh, what are we going to do about this? And one of the children stands up and says, well, do you remember when you were sick for that time and you were injured and laid out? Remember grandma helped pay for you and, and help nurse you back to health? We shouldn't turn our back on her now because she's old and can't help us pay the bills. But the rest of the children all gather together and plot against the grandma and say, you know what? We have to step in and take care of the situation. And not only then will we be able to get rid of her and her burden, but we'll be able to collect on the insurance after she's dead. So they plot to kill her and they kill her. That is what this generation does. Rather than stand in the gap for the people that are lost and falling and mourn and weep and beg and plead for God to take this cup of judgment away from us, we simply just throw grandma under the bus. Yeah, we're going to get saved in the rapture. God's coming to rescue us. As for all of you, who cares about you? It's me that God wants. I'm special. I'm important. They're willing to throw their own people under the bus in order to escape. That is not fruits of repentance. That is not a fruit of mourning. That is not the fruit that Jesus took with him on the cross. That he would multiply and that we would do the works of him. That's not that fruit. Every single person who speaks like that has no idea what they're speaking about. Has no idea where the heart of God is. They're in it for themselves and they're in it to profit for themselves. As they will do anything to escape the judgment that is coming. Rocks fall on us and hide us from the, from the wrath of the Lamb that is to come. They will do anything to escape it. Because they have grown lukewarm, believing that they're hot. It's like this generation sits and talks all day long about things that are to come. Things that they know. Things that they understand. But they're going through the motions of it. They don't feel any of it. It's like going to read a eulogy of somebody that you do not know. There's no heart in that eulogy. It's like going to high school when you're a senior and just throwing in the towel because you know you got passing grades. You don't care. You don't give any extra effort. You don't care. You're already passing. You're going. That's what this generation does. It goes through the motions of believing in God, but it doesn't know anything of him. It's thrown in the towel. The time has come where we can beg and plead all we want for the Lord to take this cup from us. But the destruction is inevitable. And there's no other day in the history that matches the season, the signs, everything that Jesus said to look for, in exact parallel to what happened to him, if you have the eyes to see, than what comes this April 8th to America. And that's the only day that this people thinks nothing about. Or they're going through the motions talking about what it can mean without any heart, without any feeling of what they're actually talking about. They're talking about the world that God so loved being thrown into the hands of Satan, the people that God so loved, given over to the devil. 
And they're eating and drinking and laughing and partying and celebrating. And they're saying peace and safety. Nothing will happen to us. I am a queen on a throne. I will never mourn. They're going through the motions rather than actually having the heart of the Lord that died for them. So while grandma got thrown under the bus by them, Jesus allowed himself to be thrown under the bus by them. We should at least do for grandma what she has done for us. As she took care of us when we were sick, helped pay extra bills when we couldn't work, but we don't return the favor. And that's what a wicked, evil servant does in an adulterous generation that we live in. It throws everybody under the bus. It takes the mercy God gave them and stores it up, rather than giving it out to anybody else. Rather than extending that mercy that they were given, they just swallow it up and say, I want to be saved. I don't care about everybody else. Let the end come. Let judgment come. They deserve it when all of us deserve it. They're going through the motions and they cannot see. They do not have the eyes to see these things. So thus everything that they say will come to pass and is right, but they don't recognize that they're the ones that enter into exactly what they warned of. God is led by their own mouths, their own fates, their own judgment. If you are experiencing these kind of things like I've I've spoken of, understand that The reason we're experiencing these things, the reason why we're not being healed, it's not because of our faith. It's because it's time. The time has come. And there's no taking that cup away because the people don't want it taken away. They want what they want. They believe what they believe. Each has gone to their own way. As a Protestant will say to a Catholic, you believe in Mary, you worship Mary, Mary is your God. And a Catholic will say to a Protestant, you worship Israel. Israel is your God. Jews are your people. And both are right because they're both hypocrites. Both neither knowing God. The same as all these people that you'll hear speaking on YouTube. It's all hypocrites. Not because God didn't extend the mercy to them so that they could blaspheme him all day long but because they refuse to extend that same mercy to their brothers, to their sisters, to their friends, to those who are lost. They refuse to stand in the gap and say, Lord, take this cup from this people. They're celebrating the death of America. They're celebrating the death of the world because death is what they have loved and desired more than the light that is life in Jesus Christ. They're turning him over. They're Judas kissing his cheek. And it's only now in these last days that we can be fully aware of these things because only the disciples in the last days were fully aware then of what they were going into. I can't say for certain that this is going to happen like this. Maybe it is something different. Maybe we just don't understand. I don't know. But what I can say is if there is ever a time to put everything together with the eyes to see and to be looking for something on that day, it would be this day that's coming up just a little bit from now because it's matching the scriptures word for word, spirit for spirit, but it's doing it using the body of Christ rather than Jesus himself which is what we know we are. The crucifixion of the Spirit. It feels as though we're walking in those days. And all we can say is, Lord, take this cup from us. Forgive them, they know not what they do. Even though we are aware that this cup is not going to be taken. God bless.